I've realized it even more now. For me, that's a small list. I'm very, very careful with who I would invest my family's money with, but I'm also very, very careful with who I would invest someone else's money with. Are you ready to transform your life? This is a no-nonsense show helping immigrants like you create generational wealth, even while working full-time. Get ready to take notes. Here's your host, Socket Jane. Welcome back, my Great to Wealth listeners. Today, we have the pleasure to talk to Jason Balera. Jason, how are you, buddy? I am good, Socket. How are you doing? We're good. We're good, man. I was reflecting back on when I was on your podcast, and I had we had so much fun and great conversation. I'm like, you know what? Let's invite you back. So thank you for making yeah. the time. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. And yeah, it was a blast when you were on mine. Yeah, Jason, where, where are you calling us from? I am in Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Oh, my God, man. You guys have had California had a lot of issues recently. How are yeah. you guys holding up? Yeah. You know, guys are Some okay? serious rain. But it's been fine at our house. I mean, we don't live in a valley. We don't live on side of a house where things are, you know, kind of getting. Yeah, well, I saw away. the. La- I was showing my girls the pictures of landslides. I'm like, that. That is major. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it hadn't rained honestly in like a year, so it mm. didn't. They, everything was so dry, and then it kind of just poured down for. So about- you needed the water, but not that much water. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's how it happens here. You don't get any rain yeah. and then you get a ton of it in a while. And it, it's, yeah, that's, I don't know. It's nice to have sunshine a lot, but probably be right. good if the rain was spaced out. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree, man. Well, I'm glad you guys are doing well, man. Yeah, I'm glad. absolutely. Thank you. Awesome. So how's uh, the New Year been, Jason? It's been good. Yeah, today, yeah. actually, as we're recording, today is my son's fourth birthday. So, uh, Oh, awesome, man. Congratulations. Time. Happy birthday to him. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you again. Even now, even more important, thank you for taking the time out. Yeah, well, he's at school, so it works out well. And oh, then, that's uh, perfect. After we record, I can go get him, and we'll spend the afternoon and evening doing fun things to celebrate his birthday. Awesome, and I'm pretty sure you guys will have a blast. So, Jason, <laughs> yeah. without further ado, my friend, I know you're in multifamily syndication space, but I would love to get an introduction from you of what you do, a very high level, and then we'll go deeper into your story. Yeah, sure. As you said, I'm in a multifamily syndication. I've been doing that for coming up on three years now. Well, prior to and still, I am also a veterinary surgeon as my, you know, sort of day job, the career path I chose before deciding to get more serious into real estate investing. I've always had a background in real estate, mostly at the construction level. But yeah, it's been a pretty cool journey kind of making that transition. You said about three years ago, you moved into the multifamily syndication. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Help us understand what was that path like for you. And then we'll, there's one more thing I want to ask is because you switched from a very technical skill set, which you spent a lot of time on and energy on and, hope, and probably money on. And then you moved into the real estate space and maybe these stories are intertwined. I would love to get yeah. some more perspective on that. Yeah. I mean, and definitely they are intertwined. As I mentioned, I have that sort of background in construction, mostly on the residential side. I did do Mm -hmm. some small multifamily back in Boston. I worked with multiple contractors through my teens and early 20s, worked with electricians. So I got a lot of exposure to the construction side of things. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what I did from an investing standpoint was on my own homes or friends' houses, or we owned a three family. So it was really kind of on a small level. And I thought of it more as, you know, kind of survival than investing. And then as I said, you know, sort of three years ago, I had, we basically had reached a point where I didn't have any more projects of my own. Our own house was done. We had completely renovated that down to the studs and I'm not one to sit around. And so I started to look into investing as a more serious thing as a business. And how could I use that to basically to provide myself more time with my family? I mean, that was Mm -hmm. ultimately the kind of inciting event was having my son. And then, you know, now we have a daughter as well, but just realizing that, as you mentioned, being a surgeon takes a lot of time, takes a lot of attention. So any money I would make was tied directly to how much time I would spend working. And so I really went into real estate and specifically syndication after doing a bunch of research about it with the thought process of this can allow me to have more time freedom to spend with my family. I mean, that's ultimately the reason behind it, the why for what I did and and why I've been making that transition. Well, that's exactly what my motivation has been. I think that that actually is a very common motivation because eventually you realize it could be age, 
it could be life, it could be whatever, it kind of, it hits you that there's more to life than just working hard. And there are other oh, ways yeah. to, yeah. there are more leverage points in life that the world has provided us. That if you yeah. pull the right lever, we may actually be able to grow our money much faster without actively getting involved. So no, I definitely appreciate that. So Jason, tell us, how is that working out for you for so far? I know you've spent about three years into it. And of course, now you have, you're still, you're still a surgeon, practicing surgeon. I am still a surgeon, yes. You're still doing your multifamily investing passively, and you're also doing multifamily actively. So if you Correct. look at these three things, I thought you were trying to get your time back. But <laughs> one could say that you're actually working harder now than you were working as a surgeon. So help, give us some perspective. Yeah, and it's definitely, I mean, if you're going to be a completely passive investor, certainly you can really truly sort of be hands off if you want to, you vet the sponsor, that sort of thing, and let them take care of things. For me, like I said, my background is construction, so I really like the idea of being involved on the mm -hmm. asset management side of things. Mm -hmm. And you're 100% right, from a time perspective, from a passivity standpoint, being active in multifamily syndication, it isn't passive, it does require some yeah. time. However, it's time that I have control over. So I have scaled back the amount of surgery that I do. I don't have a W-2 job anymore. I have my own business that we use as essentially as a way to pay the bills and to be generate capital for investing either within our own deals or within mm -hmm. others. But ultimately, when you go into real estate, I think sometimes if you're truly a passive investor only, then your time is still going to be spent on whatever your best use of your time, your most valuable use of time. So if you're a doctor or a lawyer or something like that, and you just keep doing that and generating capital, you can invest it passively to eventually build that, you know, portfolio up enough, the passive income can support you. If you want to be active in the real estate space, you kind of get to, you know, sort of 2x, 3x that return by being on both sides of the table. So I invest passively in all my own deals as well. And I'm also, I've got that, you know, sort of ownership component on the general partnership. So, but from a time standpoint, it allows me to do the things I need to do almost when I want to do them, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, you know, as I mentioned, today's my son's birthday. I have the opportunity to come on your podcast, to chat with you. And then I can still say, hey, this afternoon, I'm spending time with my son. Correct. Correct. Because that's what's important. So it's not so much, I didn't necessarily want to work less. I wanted to be gone less. And yeah. as a surgeon, you can't be doing surgery outside of the OR, right? So I don't make money if I'm not doing There's surgery. There's no work from home as a surgeon? Not yet? Right. <laughs> exactly. No, it would, that'd be a little weird, I guess. But yeah, that's what it really comes down to. It's like, I love doing surgery. I really liked the people I worked with. It wasn't, I wasn't in that scenario where some people are, are where they're just so desperate to get out of their W-2 job that they turned some, I wasn't so much trying to escape. I was just trying to find a better way to manage it all and create more time freedom and eventually move towards the more passive aspects of yeah. it. You know, in five, 10 years, I'll be happy to be in a position where I only have to work if I want to whether right. that's in surgery right. or real estate. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's an important distinction, right? Because I think one of the things is that everyone that I talk to, they're like, why wouldn't I just be active? Why would I invest as passive, especially if they have some capital yeah. accumulated, right? And my yeah. answer to them always is, don't answer that question about where you're going to get better return. You have to figure out from a perspective of what are you giving up, right? Yeah. If you're only after returns, yes, I mean, Forget about syndication. You go buy your own deal right. just by yourself because that's going to be the economically, that's going to give you the most bang for your buck. But it mm -hmm. also you alone is going to be managing the entire property and multifamily is not a real estate. It's actually a business, right? So that essentially yeah. means you'll really be running another business. You're buying a business. And for anyone of my audience has ever had any businesses before, business is not passive no matter what they say. There's no absentee owner business. If there is one, you end up selling them because they don't work well, right? So you have, it's an right. active, by definition, it's an active right. activity. So if you want to just offer economics, that's great. Yeah, you should do that. But then there's yep. a balance of it comes at a sacrifice of your personal. What are your thoughts on that? No, I totally agree. I think 
that sort of question, I, I do think that gets, I talked to investors, you know, about investing and, and they're like, I think I'm just going to buy a duplex. I'm like, okay. It's not to say that that's a bad decision, but the problem is, is that you have all of that work that goes along with mm-hmm. it. And I can tell you, you know, maybe a, an unpopular thing to say or bursting a little bit of a bubble, but specifically in the recent markets, both when, you know, a year ago when interest rates were low, but prices were super high and now interest rates are high and prices are kind of fighting that battle. The reality of my actual real estate income, like mm-hmm. the money that is coming into me, it's coming from my passive side of these investments, yep. not from the active side. Now, at the end of the day, on paper, my net worth is higher from owning these things and having, but that's not anything I'm going to realize for a number of years. Correct. So people, unless you have a very large chunk of capital to put in, you're unlikely to, and you probably had to generate that some way if you weren't, you know, it wasn't an inheritance, mm-hmm. but unless you have a very large chunk of capital to put in, you're not likely to just live off the passive component of an investment initially anyway Mm -hmm. but get it in there use the power of time the power of compounding and in five or ten years sure maybe that you know once your money has doubled and then doubled again you absolutely kind of get to that point and that's what i'm trying to do but i think a lot of people think oh well i'll just do it myself and and you can for sure you can but it's not as easy as you might might think, I guess, is, correct, is correct. from from looking at it from the outside. And I think easy, I'll just add another dimension to it, right? So I think, I think most of us, our dream, I know my dream, and I know your dream, Jason, is to have these active activities generate enough cash accumulation that it feeds into the passive income work stream. So your passive right. income is far exceeding, not just meeting, far exceeding your living expense. And when we're talking about living expense, we're not talking about hand-to-mouth living expense. We're talking about the quality of life that you would really choose to have right. and spend time doing yep. vacations and everything else, right? So we're not talking about just them meeting your living expenses. We're basically matching or exceeding your quality of life. So for that to happen, you said it right, right? You need to have some liquid cash available that you can invest. If you have millions of dollars available right now and you get into the right deal, maybe it gives you enough money that you can live off. Great. Mm-hmm. But there's the problem with all those the scenarios are you have to build a buffer up. So if you're expecting a $10,000 a month, you have to make at least passively thirty to $40,000 because what happens is there's variability, market shifts, right? And if that's right. what you're living off of, that makes it harder. So not everyone should quit the W-2 and go into passive investing right away, but it's a path to build a roadmap available to kind of use this as a vehicle to do that, right? Now, if right. you want to be active in real estate, great. Everything has pros and cons. Nothing is perfect in life. But I think what Jason and I both have been talking about so far is passively investing because both of us are passive investors, our own deals, and in somebody else's deal that we put our own due diligence into because we appreciate and respect the freedom that the potential income, potential, the passive income has the potential to give us to. Yep, absolutely. And like I said, that is ultimately my goal and my goal for my investors. And it's not, you know, I talk to investors and I, you know, they'll tell me, well, I want to retire in three years. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm not sure that I can do that for you. Well, you can, can if get... you just have a ton of money already, right? Right, exactly. Right. Yeah. I can get you retired in three years if you already have millions of dollars to invest. But it, it's right. something that what people look at is like, we have, well, say the minimum money on a deal to invest is $50,000. And and that's a lot of money. But what they're not thinking about is they're saying, oh, that $50,000 isn't going to, that's not going to get me, you know, retired. Mm -hmm. But that $50,000, if you say it doubles every five years, which is a fairly conservative, reasonable expectation in these indications, now it's 100,000, then it's 200,000, then it's 400,000, and it grows quickly. And if you're investing 50,000 each year, or you're doing something to kind of grow that, it snowballs very quickly. And truly in five or 10 years, maybe 15, you know, you got to look at where you are in your life as well. And this is why I'll get really, really passionate when I'm talking to young people, like, because if you start earlier, and it's doubling every five years, it's just a simple math problem, you have longer for it to double. It's like, I started this whole game when I was about 45. So for me, I've been very aggressive 
in trying to sort of push that mm -hmm. ability to get as much invested so that it has time to grow. But if you're starting at 25, it really isn't that hard to yeah. be a millionaire in your 40s. Like, it really isn't that hard. I mean, it's really the power of compounding, right? Power of yeah. compounding yeah. is the power. It reflects me, it kind of it reminds me of a story I always think about. Whenever we talk about compounding, to put some perspective into it, if the stadium that's getting filled with water, it's a closed stadium, getting filled with water, and it took about 10 hours to fill the stadium to half of it, and it takes one minute to double the water in it, how much time will it take to fill the stadium to full? Not 20 hours, 10 hours right. in one minute, right? right? That's what compounding does to you. You may be starting slow. Your 50 to 100, your 100 to 200 may seem slow, but eventually it gets to a point where the doubling, the impact of doubling your money could blow up your mind, right? You could ease, you, in the next 10 to 25 years, in about 25 years, that number becomes $2 million, right? Right. And then soon enough, next five years, it becomes $4 million, $5 million. And to your point, if you're investing $50,000 every year, because the example that we just gave to the audience was just one deal, that you just right. wait for that $50,000 to become $2 million. But if you're investing $50,000 every year and everything works out in your favor, because of course, it's, it's an invest, investment is a game, right? And there's risks involved. So we're not saying that everything is going to work out in your favor, but if our projections and your projections and everything works well, you're now compounding much faster. And the sooner you start, if you start at 60, it's going to take you longer time, right? But if you start at 20, 25, 30 year old, you're going to get there much, much faster. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's just, you have, it really, if you sit down and write it out and actually look at it, you know, make yourself a little calendar. I saw, um, I've seen this before, but it's basically like if you double a penny every day mm -hmm. for a month, at the end of the month, you have like a million and a half dollars. Right. And I would see that and I'm like, no, there's no way that that's yeah. possible. I literally took a calendar one time and I wrote it out because I didn't believe that it was that powerful, mm -hmm. but it is. I've seen it stated as like if you, um, you know, a child's born and you promise them, you give them a penny when they're born and you promise them at every birthday, you're going to double it. like you're giving them a very large amount of money at 18. Like it's just right. kind of a crazy chat, uh, just phenomenon of compounding. It, it's really remarkable how it can work in your favor. Yeah, if you, well, I, just harness it. <laughs> I think people just don't realize it. Right? And what Albert Einstein said, the right compounding is one of the biggest magic in the world. That it, once you realize it's not magical, it's just math, but it actually is good. Right. And it reminds me also of, you know, that you know, when we're talking about stock market and real estate, like at least my investors are always talking about, hey, you know, what about stock market and this and that? And I always remind them, look, let's only, let's compare passive to passive. A passive investment in a stock market gives you about 6 to 7% return. So by the principle of 72, which is 72 divided by your yield equals how many years, roughly, your money doubles. So if you're getting 7% return, your money doubles in 10 years. So going back to your example of doubling the penny faster, you could take the penny to double in 10 years, or you can take the penny to double in five years, or you can take the penny even faster. The faster your money doubles is what the intuition we're trying to talk about is the sooner your money is deployed, that's one thing, and the sooner your money uh, starts, starts making yield in it, the faster it'll double and the faster you'll see the impact of compounding. Because you know, right now, a lot of folks are worried about deploying their cash. Because um, cash is powerful, right? Uh, for at least emotional comfort, it gives you the emotional comfort. Or with the security blanket of when the market hits the it, hits it down, I'm going to time it. I'm going to buy the entire market. Well, when have, I mean, we're all, I'm, I'm, I'm over 40. I'm, Jason, I'm thinking you're over 40. So we're in our 40s. I have never been able to time the market in the last 40 years. Uh, no never. Way. No, no one, one has. No one in the history yeah. has been able to time the market correctly. It just it just doesn't work. It, it, and you shouldn't you shouldn't try. It. And again, it's I don't have a problem with people investing in the stock market, but you're right. It's it's a totally different animal. The other thing that I sort of struggle with that bothers me about sort of the traditional retirement path is everything's invested in the stock market, right? Like yeah. people have their 401ks, their IRAs, it's in the stock market. And then you get to 65 or whatever, when you start taking, but in order to take that money out, you have to actually sell the stock. Correct. So your overall money just keeps going down. Mm -hmm. That's not happening on real estate. 
right? Like no. you're still getting this cash flow. If you have a, you know, whatever it is that you're cash flowing a hundred thousand dollars on a million dollar piece of property, you still have that piece of property, right? So Correct. it's cash flowing you your money, and the nest, you know, that sort of principle it's is still, still growing. Sitting. It's appreciating. Right. It's still growing. Yeah, yeah. And that's not going to happen <clears throat> in your stock portfolio when you turn sixty five and you take your four percent every year and you hope that you don't live longer than that money lasts. Right. Like it just, it's kind of a sad way to approach Yeah, you have retirement. the 4% rule that if you want $200,000, you multiply that by 25 and that should be your net worth. I mean, it's fine. I'm sure that works for some people. But for me, to your point, I don't, I'm not making this money to start selling my assets to feed my lifestyle. That's not the thinking I have, right? I have the thinking of assets that actually give me money to hold them. Not to sell them. Because the moment I've sold yeah. them, that asset is gone. And these multifamily, this real estate gives us that opportunity to do that. And of course, multifamily is my bread and butter. So I'm assuming is yours as well. At it least is. the investment type. But, but yeah, I think this conversation completely shit took the turn. <laughs> and it went into yeah. a direction where it's an interesting direction. So coming back to multifamily and you, Jason, sure. tell us your journey, man. When did you acquire your first deal? How did it look like? Actually, let's yeah. talk about the past step first, right? Let's talk, let's talk this. I think this is going to be more value add. So when you decided to shift into multifamily asset class, how did you make that decision? What was going in your head? What were some of the next immediate steps? And what process did it take you from mindset to acting and then to investing in your first deal? Let's help us that process. Understand that. Yeah, sure. Well, so as I mentioned, we had sort of finished the renovations on our own house mm -hmm. and I was trying to decide what to do next. And I have flipped houses before. And so initially I thought, well, maybe I'll flip houses. I'm, I live in Los Angeles. So right. buy and hold in Los Angeles is a little bit harder to really kind of generate cash flow on. It can be done. It's not to say that it's impossible, but it's not sort of not the generally why people invest in LA. It's more of right. an appreciation market. Right. So I thought, okay, I'll go ahead and I'll flip houses. However, as I mentioned, my goal in all of this was more time and flipping houses was going to create me another job. I'm definitely a DIY guy. I can flip a house by myself. Mm -hmm. It's just, I didn't need to add that to the mix of things I wanted to do. Right. And so then I started to look and interestingly, I mean, it came down to probably like it does for most people, you know, sort of education. I started reading some books and listening to podcasts. The first one that had a really big impact was Long Distance Investing by David Green. And I read that book and I was like, huh, I don't have to do this in California. I can do yeah. it anywhere else in a different market. And so I actually dove into that. I started, I was looking for properties and as that process was going on, I was reviewing properties, hadn't found anything. I continued to read, listen to podcasts, and I came across the first multifamily syndication podcast I had listened to. I think it was someone on Bigger Pockets, mm -hmm. and I had actually at that point never heard of it. I mean, this was early. You had never heard of Bigger Pockets, or you never heard of multifamily? Sorry, multifamily syndication. Multifamily I had, syndication. I'd never heard of syndication. I know, I Got know it. of apartment buildings. I lived in them right. my whole life growing up, so right. I understand apartments very well. But I just always assumed that was a one uber rich person owned Correct. owned the apartment Correct. so i heard about syndication on a bigger pockets podcast and was really intrigued by it and kind of just like i dove in i just i bought books i listened to everything i could find about multifamily and i was like yeah this is way better cuz i in my head i had sort of come up with i would need to buy probably 100 single family homes to get to the point from a passive right. place where i wanted to be and then I realized, but wait, I can buy a hundred door apartment yeah. complex one time and be sort of at the same place. Now, full disclosure, as we sort of alluded to before, it's not the same. I'm not buying that hundred unit apartment complex by, by yourself myself, where you might buy those single families by yourself. But still, there are definitely efficiencies to that scale, both in expenses and income. And so I started diving into that. I looked actually at that point, looked into several different mentorships. I ended up doing a mentorship in multifamily. And then, you know, this was all through 2020, early 2021. Mm -hmm. And then I was looking for properties and it, it took me about, I think nine or 10 months before I really found the first property that made sense. And I was able to get a LOI accepted. And so that was in summer of 2021 and got that under contract. And I incidentally 
during the due diligence phase for that one was talking to the broker and asked if he had anything else got a second one under contract at the same time congratulations so, that's awesome yeah it was nice we closed the first two both closed in december of 2021 so okay. that was kind of the start to it all uh, that first and one, that was on the uh, active side and along the way when you were trying to learn the art yeah and science yeah. of it were you investing in passive at that time or not at that yes, time? yes I, I also invested passively how do you um, find those of, so I actually invested with my mentor. So I think, you know, this gets talked about a lot, but if you're going to invest passively vetting the sponsor and investing with someone that you know, like, and trust, it's everywhere. I'm not saying anything novel here, but I've realized it then, but I've realized it even more now. For me, that's a small list. You know, yeah. I don't am very, very careful with who I would invest my family's money with, but I'm also very, very careful with who I would invest someone else's money with. And so right. I would, if an investor came to me, one of my investors, they don't have a deal. Like I said, there's a small, or I don't have a deal, sorry. There's a small list of people that I would say, okay, here you go. Here's someone that I, yeah. you know, 100% believe that they will take care of you. I'll put it this way. My wife knows that if this is morbid, but if I pass away, she can take the insurance policy money. She knows who to go to. Who to go to. Yeah. There's, and well, that, that's have, important, right? That's very important. Because right. she doesn't really, she's not involved in the business. She's very supportive, but she's not involved. But she knows enough that I know that I've told her, hey, like, you'll be able to take our, you know, whatever comes of <laughs> your inheritance. Yeah. You'll be able to invest <clears throat> it and live off that. So go to these people and they'll yeah. take care of you and trust them. So it is a small list in it. That whole thinking is a large part of, of also why I actively invest. Because if I want to have the control of those deals for my investors, that mm -hmm. I know that I'm going to treat them the way I would treat you know my own family's money. Of course. And I think that's the most important piece, right, Jason? You know, I, I see a lot of investors, smart people, right? Because we're not taking dumb money. We're, we're asking smart folks who have been successful, who've been highly paid, to figure out a way to diversify their portfolio and grow their wealth. So when most of them get stuck in analyzing the deal, right? That yeah. send me all the numbers, right? Weeks, if not months of analysis. And of course, by that time, the deal is gone. Then do the same exact stuff on the next one, right? Then they'll do the same exact stuff on the next one. Eventually to realize no matter, you're only reviewing an Excel spreadsheet. An Excel spreadsheet analysis is all whatever we put in into the assumption, not like we're making up numbers, but it's our best educated guess. And nobody can predict the market. We're looking at the current scenarios, where the macro is going, and mm -hmm. making our best guess. But that's not the reason to invest. That's a good thing to check, to validate. But really, you're looking at the investors, at the syndicators who actually have an experience right, of doing it, who have team of advisors who have business experience, who are basically adept at the art of business to make sure they've done it, right? Because when the decision to make a move gonna come, it's not gonna be how well the spreadsheet was written. It's really going to be how good of a businessman or businesswoman that person is, right? And that's where I think your comment about making sure you have a very small list of sponsors, and I can almost bet it that you don't even care what deal they have. If they have a deal, you're going in. And you have the sure. capital, you're going in. I mean, you may look at the deal just to make sure it checks, but that's not your, you're not spending a whole lot of time on reviewing every single number on a spreadsheet. Yeah, no, I, if I'm investing passively with someone that I trust, I'm not asking, I don't even ask them for their underwriting. Right. Because you're right. Honestly, like you can put whatever you want. It doesn't. You can, you can. You can put yeah. whatever you, you can take. There are a few levers that you can pull on an underwriting spreadsheet that make a tremendous amount of difference one way or the other. And if you're investing with someone who is just not as maybe doesn't have the level of integrity or something like that, that they're just trying to make the numbers look better, Correct. then you might want to know. An example is everybody sees a lot of deals pitched, right? They, mm -hmm. you know, if you can advertise them, they're on social media and things like that. And at this point, like sometimes I see the returns being promised and I just don't believe it. I'm like, that's not yeah. possible in this market. Yeah. Now, maybe it is. Maybe they've just found the greatest deal in the world and they're the greatest operators in the world and I would miss out. But when the people I trust are saying that those numbers are not achievable, then 
that's what I'm going to believe. And so it's, it's just it right now, if right now somebody gives you 12% cash on cash, yeah. you got to start questioning that deal. Not saying right. again, the deal is wrong. You really need to right. understand what's going on when the whole world is going to a six to seven and somebody's almost doubling their cash on cash. Right. You really got to dig deeper into that. And I've seen those deals because I know what's happening. They are, you know, there was a deal that I saw recently where the IRR was high, higher than usual. I'm like, what's going on in this market? So they calculate IRR on seven years yeah. instead of five years, right? So these are the levers now to an untrained eye, you won't know what's happening. And that's right. why there's so many levers and things to, to working with a syndicator, working with a trusted person who has some integrity. It's important yeah. because who can tell you, look, this is how I'm doing it. I'm doing it on seven years, but this is how the numbers will look at five years, right? doesn't matter. Seven, seven is not wrong, but if it's some, some folks can get misled. Yeah. And then that's where the integrity of the syndicator comes up. Yeah, hundred percent. You just have to be careful. It, it's you probably when these deals get advertised on social media, you probably shouldn't just pick one randomly and put yeah. your money in. Like it doesn't, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It doesn't mean you can't invest with a new sponsor. It just means you you're going to want to talk to them. You want correct. you want to you correct, know, correct, correct, maybe correct. get some references. Other, find some other people that. I have mean, all of us were new them. at some point, right? We we did our right. first deal, yeah. so we're not mixing on newbies are bad it's yeah. just you have to, well, you have to I, I still think of myself as a newbie i don't i'm not saying it in that a lot of people will say don't just don't invest with a new <laughs> but like you have to look too. like a lot of the newer sponsors you have maybe more experienced partners you might have right. very experienced mentors you know kind of in your back pocket so there's a lot that goes into it and it's just being careful right it's just being careful and it's just it you know you would like to think that Everybody is in top is operating with integrity, and I think most people are. But it's still you just don't want to get caught up. And frankly, like I don't think I can't say nobody, but probably very few people thought the market would be where it is right now. Correct. Like almost nobody saw this happening. It's yeah. never happened before. It's literally historically different than anything right. ever has happened right. before. So I can assure you. Nobody had interest rates going to, you know, eight and nine percent in their underwriting a year ago. Right. Like it just nobody thought that was going to happen. <laughs> nobody thought this, you know, current state of the market. But it speaks to, you know, so the people that are really good and experienced, they'll be lower leveraged. They have long term debt. They can hold longer right. if they need. to. So <laughs> there's just a it's a matter of an, and it's up to us, I think, to educate people. But it's just a matter of kind of knowing what to look for and not just going to the first deal that IRR or the cash on cash looks higher mm -hmm. than every other deal, right? Because it's Correct. those are not guarantees, right? It's they're all projections. Yeah. So what are you doing now, Jason? Right? Kind of like the market has shifted, of course. And you started at at an interesting time, 2020. 2020 wasn't yeah. the easiest yeah. time to jump into multifamily. So yeah. when as you look forward to what are changes that are happening at the macro level, how are you looking at deals differently? How are you underwriting them? Help us understand what are you seeing? Yeah. A year ago, I mean, everybody always says, like, make sure you're using in conservative underwriting. And but people weren't because you wouldn't get a deal if it wasn't truly conservative underwriting. That it, you'd mm -hmm. had to have some place that you were stretching, whether that's on the cap rate, exit right. cap rate, or it's on the rent projections, whatever it was, you're probably looking at something a little bit with rose-colored glasses. And I even there was several like articles I saw on LinkedIn and, and people in their newsletters. And it would be like, is conservative underwriting dead and all of this stuff? Well, guess what? It's back. It was <laughs> maybe go, you have to, you have to adapt for, to the market. And I'll tell you, you know, some of what I'm doing now is based on an experience I had over the summer and fall. I had, I told you I closed those two deals in December. Yeah. I closed another deal in July of 2022. Sorry. Yeah. July of 2022. At the time that was closing, I had another deal under contract. And long story short, I don't know if you remember what happened between May and like I September, it. October. A but lot of interest scars. rates went up. Yeah, interest rates went up a lot. And so unfortunately, that deal fell out of contract because the seller wouldn't come down in price and, and it just no longer made. Mm -hmm. We had underwritten what I thought was conservative for interest Oops. rate hikes yeah. and it kind of blew that out of the water. And so that was also a time where hard money deposits were still sort of market standard. So I lost a lot of money because I had to walk away from that deal. Mm -hmm. And my experience, it sucked <laughs> to put it right. Like it sucked yeah. to, to lose that money. It sucked to go through that experience. 
but I have spent, you know, sort of the last several months really looking at, I couldn't have changed what happened with interest rates, but what can I do going forward to protect against things like that? And not even just protect it, just like it taught me a lot about how I should look at the deals. And I think the underwriting hasn't changed a whole lot for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, in reality, you're underwriting a higher interest rate. Right. And that's going to, of course, you probably under, want to underwrite a bit of a higher cap rate, higher exit mm -hmm. cap rate than maybe we were doing a year ago. But ultimately, the numbers are still the numbers. I wasn't really underwriting super aggressive rent growth even last year. So I don't think there's not a lot to change other than that interest rate. The underwriting is still just a math problem. But what it did change for me is my approach to the deals, what I might put in my LOIs and my purchase and mm -hmm. sale contract who I might be willing to partner with. They're just like a lot of the ancillary stuff that I don't think necessarily gets talked about a whole lot when we talk about like the steps of acquisition or right. the steps of asset management. It's just kind of understanding. I basically only invest in Atlanta and I'm even more sort of adamant that I stick with that for right now because I know what it costs me to do things in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Right. I know what. And you have the network, you have the ecosystem there. now. Right. Right. Yeah. So I've built a team. I have boots on the ground. Like I know what it's like to be there. And to go do that now in another market, it's a time of uncertainty. Now, if I partner with someone who's familiar with that market, maybe that right. works out well. But in reality, I, I think Atlanta is still a great market. And so I, I'm just more dialed in on how I look at these things from a big picture rather than just, I want to do deals. I want to do deals. I want to do deals. And right. cause a year ago it wasn't easy to get a deal, but like the deal flow was much higher and True. you had more True. opportunity to get yourself in there. Now it's like the deal flow is much lower. I think it will come back probably in mm -hmm. Q2 or Q3, but right now I think it's being patient and just being just kind of cautious. I yeah. think is how it's, I don't, have a specific i mean even my underwriting on that deal that fell apart my underwriting on the capex budget and what renovations were going to cost that was way up from where it was on the first deal right. i underwrote so you learn those things and you know there's been a lot of inflation and materials costs are higher labor costs are higher so you learn those things and those are very market specific so it's just right. To me, it's looking at that bigger picture and, and what pieces of that big picture are most important. Well, first of all, well, thank you for sharing that story. And I'm sorry for the loss. My first deal crapped out on me. I lost a ton of money, so I know how that feels. Yeah, and I think no I want to use that as a learning point that we were talking about active investing. Active yeah. is not all making money. You're putting a lot right. more at risk than just time, right? You're putting your own money at risk. And for, for those of you who don't understand what hard money is, that's essentially an earnest money deposit that you don't get back after a certain time, right? It turns, if you default on a deal for whatever reason, unless there's some fault for a seller, which usually doesn't, you basically lost that deal. So it's a guarantee that they're using to hold yeah. against you, right? So that happens a lot. I know folks have walked away from deals losing two, three, four million dollars nowadays, right? So it's happening. Yeah. yeah. So people we have were, yeah, people have definitely lost more than I did. It's I'm not the only person this ever happened to. But I think another just to add on to that socket is it's not investor money. So Correct. that is one like really good thing. About it hits you the this. most because you're yeah, using your own. But also, I want to say that is I think it's an important one because you and I, when we're risking our own money, you could have closed that deal, right? You could have. But what would have happened is it would not have you would not have served your investors well. So right. part of that is what's the right thing to do. You and I would rather lose our own money than having to put our investors' yeah. money at risk, especially going into a deal where you know it's not going to make money because of whatever situation has changed, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's, yeah, it's, it's important to, I think people also, you know, we, we talked earlier about I want to be a passive or I want to be an active investor. Yeah. And, and, you know, a year ago, two years ago, like, Everybody wanted to get into syndication and, mm -hmm. and it seems to have quieted down quite a bit on that front. But yeah. like, because there is a lot of risk involved and it's, you should not be risking investor money. And so, 
you are risking probably your own money until right. you know you get these deals under and and so it's just an important thing to sort of point out but i say that is you know learning lessons aside that brightest spot of that whole experience is I didn't lose any investor money. And so right. Right. that would probably be feel worse than losing my own money. I don't think I can, I would be able to forgive myself, man. If yeah. knowingly I lost investors money, that's not the business I want. I didn't do this because of that, because I know how hard it is to make a dollar. The last thing I want to do is intentionally put somebody's money at risk. So Jason, 100%. I know you and I can talk at this for lens because that's our passion. Sure. But I also know that you have to go to your uh, to pick up your son and then celebrate <laughs> his birthday. So that's right. uh, we're coming towards the end of our show. So Jason, one thing, two things I want to ask you is like one of them is you've had a great ride, right? And you'll continue to having a great ride. But if you were to reflect back for your 20-year-old self to mm-hmm. share one insight with them, which is going to make their migration in life intentional right, where they're actually looking forward to whatever the migration path they end up taking. Who knows? What would that that one insight? Start sooner. Start sooner. I mean, like I said, I'm very passionate when I talk to this about young people. And I don't start sooner. It can either mean passive or active. It doesn't matter. But start thinking about your financial future as early on as you possibly can. And so If you're a parent, teach it to your kids. If you have the ability to influence young people at the high school or college level, like nobody teaches this. It's not, I went through a lot of years of school. Even in vet school, they weren't like, hey, you might want to own a veterinary business someday. Here's a class on it. Like they don't do nothing. It was almost, it was almost like frowned upon us for us to even talk about money. And it's, you have to, that was one of my biggest mindset blocks was and it's still hard it's like was one thinking about numbers on a much higher level right mm-hmm. instead of you know a hundred thousand you're a million or ten million dollars like thinking right. about numbers at that higher level but it was just talking about it just you know i have a podcast like we talk about it on the podcast we you know i have social media we talk, but that was it was uncomfortable when i started doing it it's still uncomfortable mm-hmm. although it gets less and less the more you do it but yeah knowing that that could be the single biggest impact in your future selves' lives, you need to know something about it. Yeah. You know, no, that, I think that makes sense. Of course, I think that's a journey, right? Uh, unfortunately, yeah. that tool has not been created that's widely available, easily available to people. There are resources, tons of resources available. But unfortunately, you have to look. You have to look hard yeah. and intentionally. And uh, once you start looking, it's available. So yeah, I, I, it's I, I, I definitely relate to that. The second question, Jason, we're going to take a little bit higher level right now. So what is your one wish and desire for humanity to migrate towards intentionally? This will be a turn from, I guess, real estate, but of kindness course. to each other. Yeah. I think, you know, we talked about my son because it's his birthday. And my wife have talked about this since he was born and our daughter. Like the single most important thing to us is our kids are treat other people well. Yeah. And so... I think that if I'm wish a wish for humanity, of course, is being good to each other. That's awesome, man. On that high note, Jason, where can our listeners find you? Best way to find me, you can go to the website uh, larkcapital.com. But usually, I'm most active on Instagram, and it's lark it's at Lark Capital. So either place is fine. I'm on LinkedIn as Jason Ballara. Any of the social medias, but I would say Instagram is probably the best one. Perfect. So we'll include the links below. Thank you again, Jason. Really appreciate it, buddy. And happy birthday to your son again. Yeah, thank you very much, Saga. Thanks for having me on. If you got value from this episode, you might consider sharing this content with a friend. But most importantly, be sure to take action on what you've learned. One way you can take the next step is to connect directly with Socket on an investor call. That link is waiting for you in the show notes below. The content of this podcast is for informational purposes only. Please consult your own advisors when making any investment decisions. Keep listening. We'll see you on the next episode.